Good morning. It's still morning. Dear saints, brethren, church of God, which is the church of the living God, the ground and pillar of truth, please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Please read along with me word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures we're going to be looking at today and considering. Read along with me. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Okay? Read along with me, because as you know, my mouth goes quicker than my brain, more often than not, unfortunately. So read along with me. Read along with me. Romans chapter 1. Verses 1 on to verse 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. Son of God, we, we address that, um, the three son things of the Lord Jesus. Son of God, Son of David, Son of Man. That is in the omniscient uh, video rebuking that lying fart guy, okay? That will be in the description box for you, all right? And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit, lowercase s, of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. By whom we have received, now pay attention, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, grace, unmerited favor, simplified, unmerited favor, the better blessing the lesser, he must increase and I must decrease, okay? By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? Called. Okay. Called. A God who calls. Okay. He's a God who calls. A God who chooses. Okay. The called of God. God has called everyone, all of you, all of you, to salvation. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. The Lord would have all men to be saved. Yes, he will. He wants everyone to be saved. Here's the problem. Problem? Yeah. Most of you don't want that. Because the way that he has called you to begins with death. To you. And you want your cake and eat it too. We have talked about this in depth. But it is something that um, you could beat a horse bloody, uh, to bloody with. And still not cover all the bases. It's imperative. Okay. That brokenness. So yes, the way of salvation is there for all people. But see, most people will boot the door out of the way. <laughs> And climb up some other way rather than going through the door who is Jesus Christ, their genius, who is the door instead of going through him and the way he has called. The way he has called is the way of the cross. Okay? The way of the cross, which is death. It is death before it is glory. It is pain before it is nourishment. Hmm. Okay? And we can go on and on and on. So when it says, among whom are ye also 
the called of Jesus Christ. This does not mean that ridiculous Calvinistic elect and non-elect thing. That's, that's just absurd. That's just absurd. A child reading the scriptures would not come away with such absurdity. Okay? Calvinism is wickedness. Just, you know, and it is Christian. You know, it sure is. It sure is. Yeah. Because its founder was once a Catholic. <laughs> it's funny. No, it's not. But anyway. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? Christ called you, has called you the way of the cross, which is first, first death to yourself. You have to be responsible and take responsibility and, you know, man up, woman up. You put Christ on the cross. He died because of you. It's your fault. Then you got to fear the Lord. And when you come his way, the called way, broken of yourself and taking responsibility, that will result in a fear. Because if you're broken of number one and you admit that the Lord died because you thought you were number one, that generally ought to produce in you a fear. Because grace is the better blessing the lesser. And when you come to the Lord according to his calling, the only way he has called, the way of the cross, um, when you are broken and contrite, that's going to scare you. That gonna, that's going to scare the hell out of you. And when you reach that, it's a one fell swoop. You can't wait to call upon the name of the Lord. You just can't. You can't say it quick enough, loud enough. You can't. Okay? Lost people don't understand that. False converts, they don't understand that. Okay? But called, when you go the way, the only way, Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. When you go the way he has called you, the way of the cross, and he saved you, the call. This you can also reference a look in your margin to Romans chapter 28 and what? Uh, 20. Romans 8, 28. Okay. All right. Which you read that Romans 8, 28 in a Bible, they mess it up. Okay. Look at uh, look at Romans chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? The call. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, saved, according to his purpose. Yes, God has a plan for your life. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Christianity has trivialized that. They have made it all about you, about your financial prosperity or your uh, reproductive prosperity or whatever nonsense, okay? Christianity is like, well, God's got a plan for your life. Well, meaning he wants to give you all this money, all this money. No, 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 no. God does have a plan for your life. Yes, he does. To serve him in the purpose that he has appointed for you. Okay? All right? Verse 7, to all, <laughs> to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be Christians, <clears throat> called to be saints. I don't mind if you disagree, but I'm going to tell you something, son. Watch the scriptural, watch the videos, look at the scriptural evidence. And then go ahead and shoot out the mouth. Go ahead. Fine. Weigh the argument. Okay? Genius, please do so. And then go ahead. You can disagree with me all day. I really don't care. <laughs> okay, I really don't. But at least, at least, 
consider, okay? Don't answer before you hear the whole matter, okay? That's not wise. And you know better than that. Okay? Thank you. But anyway, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A saint is a saved person. Or, as in the Old Testament, someone who is right with God. Because in the Old Testament, there was absolutely no eternal security. Okay? But, someone who is right with God, who is saved, is a saint. We are, we were called to be saints, not Christians. Okay, for that, that's another thing. Check the community thing. Okay, what my stand on that. I ain't going nowhere on that, boy. <laughs> but just, just to let you know, Okay? So we're called to be saints. And what is a saint? Uh, it, that, that one, that one, that one always floors me because when you are in public, when you are around people and you refer to yourself as a saint because of what Christianity, Catholicism has done to the word saint and have taken the pagan demigods and turn them into, you know, all the, the St. Michael, St. This, St. That of uh, Catholicism. They're all pagan demigods with Christian titles. That's it. Okay. So, and also too, Catholicism with sainthood, they're the ones who can call someone a saint and elevate the No. In the video, in the description box, there will be an extraordinary um, video that was done by um, myself and a brother. I call it, that's not being boastful. Okay, by the way, that's not. Um, we, are called, we are called to be saints. And Catholicism has taken a scriptural term for the saved and turned it into something that it's not. So when you, as a saint, are out there in the world and you refer to yourself as a saint, try that. Try it. See what happens. You know what has happened with me? Oh, or, oh, don't you think you're special? I'm, a, I'm saved. I'm saved. We're called to be saints. Okay? What do you think is a saint? And then, they, then you find out that they're describing what Catholicism is. It's like, oy vey, dude. <laughs> okay? Like I said, check out that video. Check out that video. Okay? But we are saints. We are saints. We're called to be saints, okay? And in that calling as saints, as saved people, then Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. There are a lot of people out there who claim to love God, but they love themselves even more, okay? To them who are the called according to his purpose, to save people. Okay? And when we are doing things and we are called according to his purpose, he has a purpose for us as what? Ambassadors for Christ. To not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to live our lives in accordance with Scripture, rightly divided. Okay? <laughs> All right? And to be a living, speaking witness unto the lost. In word and in deed. And see, the deed thing is where our crafty, vile enemies of Rome, and especially with her daughter of the sleazy believist movement, comes in. Because in verse 5, okay, of Romans chapter 1, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, Grace and apostleship. Grace, unmerited favor. And apostleship. Apostolos sent one. People are sent. There are only, there are, the true apostles are the ones that the Lord called. There are apostles ordained of men. But the only ones that are uh, recognized by the Lord are the ones that he called. Okay? Let me break on that. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience 
and the sleazy believist works salvationists that they are, and also many others, uh, denominations of Christianity. Is Christ divided? Yeah, Christianity is. Christ isn't. Okay, give me a break with that stuff, man. But anyway, anyway, okay, when it comes to the issue of obedience, I will have you know, the word obedience appears 14 times in the scriptures. What is obedience? It is the uh, derivative of obedient. And obedient is the derivative of what? Obey. Okay? Do what you're told. All right? Now, here's the crafty, sly argument of the sleazy believers. Uh, these, are, these are the guys who are brazen about it. Okay? Obedience. Is, is that a requirement for salvation? Hmm? Well, if you don't go the way the Lord called you to go, the way of the cross, but boot the door and climb up some other way, um, that you're not saved. You got to go the way he has called, okay? He has called, all right? You have to go the way of the cross and for, in order for him to save you, okay? All right? You just don't walk around and decide, make a mental decision, and then you're in. That's not how it works. That's a lie, okay? And that has, the fruit of that has created so much of what you see today, okay? Thanks, Rome. <clears throat> Can't wait till you're destroyed, okay? All right? The fruit of this just believe and receive nonsense is obvious. Look at it, okay? Look at it. But see, the thing of obedience, obedience. Now, in the Old Testament, where eternal security was not there, obedience was a requirement for salvation. In the dispensation of the patriarchs, okay, saints, you know what I'm talking about. In the dispensation of the patriarchs, the patriarchal period and this time, the time of the Gentiles, um, they're similar, but there are some very specific different aspects. Number one, the biggest one, Christ had yet to die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood on the cross. That's obvious, okay? But when you read in Genesis, the faith that Abraham had was in what God was going to do. I will get to a land. I will shoo thee. Noah, he's like, God said, I will. I'm going to bring a flood. You do this. So obedience in that way in that dispensation of the patriarchs was there also, okay? But remember, the dynamic there between that dispensation and this one are different, even though they are similar, because God's grace, God chose. God chose Noah. God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? And Isaac, your seed, will be called, not Ishmael, okay? God's a God who chooses, all right? All right? But the faith that was there in the patriarchal period and as well as the law is was in what God was going to future do. Okay? That's as simple as I can make it for you. We got, uh, uh, we got videos here on rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a bit of stuff. Uh, stuff in those videos, but you want to know the stuff, that's on you. All that can be done is here. If you don't want to watch it or listen to it, that's on you, man. It's your problem, okay? Go get a little shot in your Botox and get your little fluff of whatever religiosity and go on living like a devil, okay? Go ahead, okay? Go ahead, all right? But see, in this dispensation, there is eternal security which was not there in the patriarchal period, by the way. And the bigger one, our faith is in what? It is finished. Now that's simple enough, isn't it? Okay, that's simple enough, right? 
Sure is, isn't it? it? Ought to be. But this thing about the obedience. Obedience. That's the word we're concentrating on. You do your own work and uh, do the progression of that. That would be quite a study for any of you to do. That really would. It's not what this is about. But obedience appears 14 times in the scriptures. The word itself appears 14 times. Okay. But I think it appears like in 12 verses, but 14 times total. Okay. If you look on uh, King James Bible online, it's like, Brad, it's only, oh, the word itself appears 14 times. Okay. Here's what's interesting. Obedience. Obedience only appears in the New Testament. And out of the 14 occurrences of the word obedience, check me out on this, boy. Only all but two appear in the Pauline epistles. All but two. I personally do not think that Paul was the author of Hebrews, even though the Lord Jesus Christ is the author of Hebrews, okay? But that that's different. That's a totally different thing, okay? All right? You check that out. You check that out. So it's an interesting thing when it comes to this thing of obedience. Because the sleazy believers will say to you, now, th this is their craftiness. In order to be saved, stay saved, and be right with God, obedience to the law or anything like that is not a requirement. No, it isn't. You come to the Lord on his terms. You have to go in that Yes, you do have to be obedient. You have to go the way. You want to be saved? It's easy. Go the way he said to go. You don't boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. That's not how it works. If you've done that, you're not saved. Period. I ain't going to sugarcoat it for you. I ain't going to be nice about it. Nice. <laughs> nice. Find me that. Okay, I'm not. All right? The Lord is specific. Read about in Exodus how specific, detail-oriented our Lord is. It was is about building like the tabernacle. Okay? Check it out. You want to be saved? You have to go the way he has prescribed. Okay? But see, the sleazy believers comes along and offers you, well, hey, just believe. And of course, faith, belief is an integral part of salvation. Yes, it is. But how you arrive at that is the important thing, which they overstep and ignore. Okay? But they come along and say, just believe. Just in your head. Mental decision. And you're saved. Hmm. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. If you don't go the way that the Lord has prescribed, the way of the cross, you're not saved. You're a thief and a robber, period. Okay? But once the Lord saves you, you come to him broken, okay? Contrite and in fear of him. You call upon him. You like, save me. He saves you. Some things happen. Okay? Some things happen. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed... Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise and sealed. The Lord dwells within you permanently on a full-time basis. He is the Holy Ghost. The Lord is that Spirit. Jesus Christ, God our Father. He dwells with you. He seals you. Eternally secure. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the purchase, until the which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased 
possession unto the praise of his glory. We saints are his purchased possession. And the seal of that is him, the Lord, dwelling within us. Okay? Once you go the way of the cross, the prescribed way, and he saves you, you are sealed until the day of redemption. That's a, that's a reference onto the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Erroneously to refer to as the rapture. Okay? That's what that's talking about. You're once saved, always saved, eternally secure. You cannot lose what isn't yours. You cannot break that seal in this dispensation. Because people go to, what is it, Hebrews? I believe it's Hebrews chapter 4, and show you that, hey, people can lose their salvation, but yet they always say that you can get it get it back. When you read, I believe that is Hebrews chapter 4. When you read Hebrews chapter 4, um, there is no mention of getting salvation back. You know why? Because Hebrews, as the book of James, are books specifically written for the Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble. And that is the dispensation that is after this one. The seven-year period of Jacob's trouble, which Catholicism has taught you to believe is the Great Tribulation. I will give any of you a thousand dollars of money I do not have. If you in the scripture, the actual text of the scripture from the authorized version will produce the verse that says verbatim the great tribulation. Verbatim. Look that word up if you don't know what that means. Verbatim. The Great Tribulation. I'll give you a thousand dollars that I don't have. How's that? If you can provide from the authorized version, the King James Version, the verse where it says the Great Tribulation verbatim. Okay? Okay? But the time period that comes after this is the time of Jacob's trouble. And in that dispensation, there is no eternal security except for 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. No. For 144,000 Hebraic Jews. Okay? Other than that, there is no eternal security during the time of Jacob's trouble. And there ain't no eternal security during the kingdom of heaven either. This dispensation is the most unique in the history of mankind because God dwells within the saint on a permanent basis. Okay? Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 10. For by grace unmerited favor the blesser bending down or the the better excuse me the better bending down and blessing the lesser okay excuse me god the better stooping down and blessing the lesser us but when you got someone who comes around and wants to take the lesser and exalts that above the better oh boy well there you go Okay? You people, you have no idea what grace truly is. You sleazy believists. It's a, uh, the end is justified the means, huh? Oh, that sounds really Jesuitical, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You have no idea what grace really is. It's a license to you. You scum. The whole lot of you, you scum. And I say that to even a certain individual who I respect. Don't like him. <laughs> but I say that even to an individual I respect. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And not that of yourselves. 
It is the gift of God, not of works. Well, well, what's a work? This is self-evident. Works. The works of the law. Okay? The law was fulfilled for salvation. Okay? The works are the works of the law that Paul is referencing. Okay? Prayer is not a work. Calling on the name of the Lord is not a work. Okay? It's not. Not of works, lest any man should boast, because under the law, I, you know, I've done this, I've done that, I, I haven't broken that commandment, I haven't broke that commandment. The Catholic, I've been confirmed, I've been baptized, I had the cookie, I do penance, I do a confession, I do, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. You shall be as gods, okay? For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay? So these good works are not salvific, but rather as ambassadors. Okay? And we see here ordained. Okay? Ordain that we should walk in them as new creatures. And you're a new creature because the Lord lives within you. You are not a new... Look at me. Okay? I understand when people say, you know, about, well, has your life changed? <sighs> yes, your life will change when you're a new creature. Absolutely. 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 Are you a new creature, though? I've known drug addicts, alcoholics, pornography addicts even, who aren't saved. But they have a changed life. They have a complete change. They are a different person. But they're not new creatures, see. I understand when people are saying, you know, you have to, you're, you know, if you're saved, you have a changed life. If you're saved, you have a changed life. I get, I get it, and I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, against you. But dude, keep in mind, yet yeah, you're a new creature. You're, you're, you have a changed life because you are a new creature. Something other than you. When an alcoholic can have a changed life out of their sheer willpower. There has to be a distinction there. Look, if you if you're going around preaching that the changed life gospel, fine. But do remember, have you never experienced attacks on that level yet? Remember, people can have a changed life. Outside of being a new creature. Signify. Please. Please. Signify to the people. Okay. All right. New creature or change life. Uh, there's a video on the channel here. New creature or change life. You can have a change life. Absolutely. But is it a result because you are a new creature? And what makes you a new creature? Oh, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Let's read verse 13 in Ephesians 1. In whom ye also trusted, after that, ye, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Very quickly, just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Thank you. <laughs> Verse 17. Now the Lord is that capital S spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And it says back in Ephesians 1, verse 13, that Holy Spirit, capital S, a promise, the Lord himself. The capital S in Scripture is extraordinarily significant, Mr. Daniels. 
Okay? Extraordinarily significant. Not one to be lightly gleaned over. Okay? So, we are called as saints unto good works. And you know what? Those good works are not done at gunpoint or by force. But we have a choice to make whether to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And in order to do what is right, according to Scripture, you know what that takes? Come on, you can, you can say it to yourself, you already know. It takes obedience. Okay? You can't have all the faith in the world. But if you aren't going to do and be obedient to what the Scripture says, now see right away, Here's where the sleazy believers. Ah, you're talking to you just go to hell and shut up. No. No. Because if that were the case, then God's a liar and you're not eternally secure. Here's something to remember. Today, if you come to the Lord according to his way, the way that he is called, and he saves you, you're eternally secure. You can't lose what's yours, not yours to lose. You can't. You're once saved, always saved. Okay? Does that mean as a saint you could be totally disobedient and still go to heaven? Yes. Yes. But see, what you have to keep in there, and this is what, this is why I hate sleazy believism. Okay? Um, the way you serve the Lord reflects Him. And you may be a saint and you might decide to totally live in disregard to the scriptures. Number one, well, let's look at something. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 4, okay? Now, I just said earlier, yes, the book of Hebrews is written for another dispensation, the time of Jacob's trouble. This is a little of our instruction in righteousness, too, that we need so severely. <laughs> but don't worry, we're going to look at the verses within the Pauline epistles that address this very thing. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 4. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now today, our Lord is not holding a gun at your head, forcing you to walk according to the precepts of Scripture. Okay, He's not. Neither is the devil holding a gun at your head, forcing you to do contrary. You have to make the right decisions, brother, sister. Okay? You have to. You don't have to. But what happens if you don't? Will you lose your... Okay? Will you lose your salvation? No. No, you will not. If you come to the Lord His way and you are genuinely sealed until the day of redemption, a saint saved of the church of the living God, okay? You can't lose what's not yours to lose. Okay? Or else God is a liar. And then what are we doing? Okay? You can't lose your salvation. But there's so many other things that you can lose. And see, the sleazy believism uh, heretic explodes on that thing with the, well, the, they, these people have some of you convinced that you can live like the devil but justify it just because you believed and you never came to the Lord the way he called in the first place. It's dangerous. It's, it's, it's dangerous. Okay? And the fruit of it, you can see today. Okay? All right? If you are disobedient, you won't lose as a saint. You will not lose your salvation. But you can lose so many other things. That's why we are looking at this text right here. Because during the time of Jacob's trouble, okay, and again, the, these filthy, sleazy believers tell you that it's uh, once saved, always saved, by grace through faith, from Genesis to Revelation. You know, if the horse doesn't want to drink the water, there's nothing we can do, brethren. All we can do is present them the truth, and if they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. That's on them, okay? But during the time of Jacob's trouble, um, eternal security is not there unless you're one of the 144,000 Jews, okay? 
So obedience is a requirement. For sure. During the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. But see, today, obedience is not a requirement to stay saved. Oh, no, no. You do have to go the way he has called. Okay. You can't boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way and expect to be saved, Mr. Sam Gipp. Okay. You can't. Or else the word is a lie. Muslims notice this, and even atheists notice that one. Okay? And they got more, a lot of them have more sense than one of these sleazy believers Christians out there specifically, and especially the Catholics. Okay? Because the Catholics all boast about what they've done, just like the sleazy believers does. They boast about what they've done, save themselves through their belief. Okay? For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, you reap what you sow, dear friend. You reap what you sow. There, yeah, there's a law of re sowing and reaping, you know, like the charismatics like to throw at you. That, that's nonsense. But the truth is, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. We'll, we'll look at that here in a little bit. So, okay, you're a saved saint, okay, and you decide to close the book, throw it away, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do what I'm going to do, all right? All things are lawful for me. It's like, okay, you, you won't lose your salvation. And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. You can lose your health. You can lose... Hmm. You can lose your house. You can lose the clothes off your back. You can lose your testimony. You can lose fellowship with the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, fellowship with the brethren. You can lose so many other things. And see, that's why specifically I hate sleazy believism. Because that aspect they totally disregard and cover it with their belief. Hmm. It's disgusting, actually. But you're going to reap what you sow. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and the Jews require a sign, okay? And with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his will, the sign gifts and acts, were sign gifts for the Jews, the Hebraic Jews. They are not in operation today. Okay? If people, if there are gifts like that, they're not coming from the Lord. They're coming from the little G God of this world. Okay? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, okay? The whole point of this is for us to do what God says. And see, well, disregarding what God says does not affect our salvation as saints. How you ref serve him reflects him. And when you come around, come across these sleazy believists who disregard anything of being obedient, but are obedient onto their own whims and pleasures and justify, well, I'm saved because I can. <laughs> You're seeing the fruit of it. That's the fruit of the people that you are associating yourself with, dear friend. That's why you and I are probably never going to truly get along. I believe that you are a saint. But as the company you keep, so are you. If you needed me for anything, I'd be right there for you, brother. But... Other than that, I don't think you and I are going to get along too well. 
That's just the way it is. You know, you need me, if whatever capacity, I'll be there. Because I do believe you are a saint. I do. But um, other than that, man, um, we ain't going to get along. That's okay for us down here. Up there, it's not going to matter anyway. Okay? Okay? So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 on verse 13. Here it is. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. The dead is, of course, you saints know, being dead to the world, being dead to ourselves. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, you know, work salvationists, you know, it's like, ah, open work salvationists, you know, like the Ray Comfort type, the Calvinistic type. And stuff like that. Uh, sleazy believers are work salvationists, but they they cover it, they veil it quite well. Okay, but they are work salvationists because they save themselves by their belief. But someone would come. Well, if we deny him, he will also deny us. And then they go into the Sermon on the Mount or into the uh, Gospel accounts before. The death, burial, and resurrection, where the Lord talks about, if uh, you deny me before men, I will also deny you before my Father. Okay? Uh, instruction in righteousness. If we deny the Lord if, in that context, before the death, burial, and resurrection, the instruction in righteousness is, yes, if we deny the Lord, he will deny us. Today, how does he deny us? Not salvifically, or else the scripture is a lie. Okay? Or else the scripture is a lie. What we read in Ephesians chapter 1, we might as well disregard. Okay? So, and of course, look at verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Himself. He is within the saved saint. Okay? So, this is... A, the deny is not salvific. Because if it were, he would be not denying himself. Okay? He is our redemption. He is the seal until the day of redemption. He is our salvation. So, if we deny him, it's not that he's going to deny us our salvation. No, 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 no. And watch out for people who come to this and try to make you believe that it is. No, it's not. Because of verse 13. He cannot deny himself. He says that because he dwells within us. Okay, we are counted as the Lord's body. Okay? All right? He cannot deny himself. But he can deny us so many other things, but not salvation. And just because you can do something you know you shouldn't and it's not going to cost you your salvation doesn't mean that you should go ahead and do it just because it won't cost you your salvation. And that's the mentality of the sleazy believist. What? That's insanity. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it, it, it's like, what, what kind of mind, what kind of thought process is that? tell you that's the thought process of a religious false convert that's what that is that's what that is okay and first corinthians 11 first corinthians 11 first corinthians 11 verses 26 on to verse 32 we're looking at this kind of... Now, this is talking about the Lord's Supper, which, unlike Catholicism tells people, is not salvific, okay? You know, they drink their little wafer, they drink, they eat their little wafer cookie and drink the wine that the Jesuit priest, you know, abracadabra, hocus pocus, woody woody, and turns these things into in transubstantiation. It's laughable. It's not funny, but it's laughable. It's nonsense, Okay. The um, communion is not salvific. Communion is something to do in remembrance and self-examination. Self-examination. 
Somewhere, brother, you, you had asked me about that, and somewhere in here got the notes for that. It's just I had that one day where I tried to do it, but I lost my cool, and since then the Lord has not said do it again. Uh, hopefully he will. But we're looking at this in verses 26 on to verse 32, and you'll, and you'll catch why we are looking at this. Context, this is talking about um, taking the Lord's Supper, you know, having communion with the Lord which is a time of self-examination and remembrance, okay? But see, when you don't examine yourself and you do things contrary to the Lord, unworthily, verse 26 on to verse 32, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Are we not supposed to daily shew the Lord's death till he come? Death to ourselves and death to that, Okay? Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and of the body and blood of the Lord. The purpose of communion. But let a man examine himself. Yes, and to, you know, to have fellowship with the Lord. Yes, I do this in remembrance of me. Yes, but examination. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink that cup. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. And you're going to see when we get there, um, when the Lord specifically gives you something to do and the way to do it, our Lord is very specific, okay? He, he's a stickler for specificity, if I'm even saying that right. I know, I know if I'm not, I'll be corrected, okay? He is. He's very specific, okay? Our Lord does not leave gray area, all right? He doesn't, all right? So when our Lord gives you a specific way, the way of the cross, and then someone comes around telling you contrary, and you don't, Number one, check it out with the Lord, and the Lord himself hasn't even given you an inkling when, as before, you were not doing it contrary to what he was talking about. My, what is, what you, you'll see. You'll see. Self-examination. You're doing what the Lord commands us to do as saints. Walking in the scriptures, being a, a, an example onto the lost, being ambassadors. Then around comes somebody and wants to take you away out of that way. And it's like, hey, don't worry about it. You just believe. So just go ahead and live. You could go to that Hollywood movie. Watch those stupid television programs. Play them video games. Get drunk every night. Hey, hey, hey. you get a new slate every morning. That's true. But, I mean, hey, just go ahead. Don't worry. And someone who doesn't, it's like, wait a minute, l let me check this out. Uh, n no, <laughs> no, get the hands. No, thank you. No, thank you. I'll be an old fuddy-duddy and be whatever in the eyes of the world. You go ahead, Mr. Worldly Wise. Okay? That, what we just went through, will make sense here in a minute. All right? Verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Oh boy. And every disobedience uh, receives a recompense of a reward. I know we just read it. Hmm? You reap what you sow. Oh boy. Oh boy. For this cause are many weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Weak and sickly. Hmm. Consequence. You've dabbled with magic. Your fingers are burnt. Hmm. It's like you put your hand in the bag of Cheetos and then you come out, your fingers are orange. Mm. Mm. And right away, 
contrary to my little notes here, Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> um, uh, not Ephesians, right. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, verses, come on, verses 1 on to verse 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That ye should not obey the truth. Obey the truth. Is it at gunpoint? No. No, it isn't. But there are heavy consequences that don't just affect you. And see, that's the thing. Okay? If you're saved, you are the Lord's ambassador. And if any of these sleazy believers were truly saved, that would mean something to them. But what means something to them is justifying their sins. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? By the way Paul lived. They did not obviously see the actual crucifixion. No, they were seeing Christ crucified in Paul. Okay? In Paul. What is he talking about? Oh, uh, look up. Uh, verse 20 and 21 in Galatians 2. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Okay? And the Lord is that spirit, the Holy Ghost. Okay? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. See, when we are disobedient, we frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then is Christ dead in vain. Verse 2 in chapter 2. This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, capital S, are ye, now, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? And I think that the longer a saint goes, that's the problem with the longevity of the saint. That's something that I fear. Because what happens? You can get, I'm going on 16 years old, okay? I'm going on 16, and I purposely work at trying to keep it fresh, if you will. Read the, read the scriptures with new eyes, even though I've read it like hundreds of times or whatever, you know? This is the day the Lord hath made. Take nothing for granted. We are to be in relation daily with the Lord, but it's a problem when you become familiar too familiar, and you lightly esteem it. And I've seen that in a lot of the elderly Christians especially. It's almost a th an air of flippancy. Okay, Yeah, we've been there, done that, but that mustn't be how we live our life. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. I hope it does. Okay? I hope it does. Now back to 1 Corinthians 11. Okay? Verse 30 again. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Because they took communion unworthily. They didn't examine themselves. They didn't examine themselves. And obviously, in not examining themselves, and some were getting sick and weak, weak and sick, and some slept dead. You know, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, I believe it is, hand to hand such a one on over to... <laughs> First Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Huh? Note the S, the, uh, the spirit, the S on that one in that verse, huh? Hmm? Question. How's our obedience? How's our obedience? 
Now, if you want to chop this video up and just try um, do it to here, uh, you know, the original is right here, okay? It's not talking about salvation. It's talking about your everyday life, kind of how you serve the Lord. Hmm? For if we would, uh, continuing in 1 Corinthians 11, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Hence chastening to get us away from that. Part of my devotional reading this morning, I almost, and you know who I'm talking to, I almost emailed you with this, but the Lord's like, no, no, Brad, he'll watch it. <laughs> uh, you, you share this. And I go, okay. First Kings chapter 13, 11 on to verse 24. Now, this is uh, a rebuke unto Jeroboam. A prophet came around and gave him a sign about the altar and Jeroboam's hand got frozen like this or something like that. And um, whatnot, uh, the one prophet here prays to the Lord and his hands free. Jeroboam's like, hey, dude, come back with me and I'll let you eat and feed you and give you a reward. Okay. Verse 9 in 1 Kings chapter 13. For it was, for so was it charged me by the word of the Lord saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So this guy, he came in from the, the, the north. Okay? He did his duty, and he was supposed to go out by the south. Not eating anything, drinking anything. The significance of that is simply, okay, the Lord called him from this way to go this way. Don't stop. You don't got time to mess around. Don't drink anything that's offered there, especially by the king. And you're going to see this. The king, who is rebuked, was offering him a reward. Okay? King Jeroboam. Okay? <laughs> yeah, King Jeroboam. Okay? Look up on him. Okay? I don't think Mr. Jeroboam was right with God. Okay? So, this guy, this prophet was warned, hey, don't eat what they give you. Don't don't eat anything because that because of where you're at. You're my ambassador, my messenger. You go in that way. Say what you gotta do. Go out the other way. Don't go back. Don't rebuild the bridges that you broke. Don't go back. Don't be as Lot's wife and look back, yearning, longing for what you had as a lost person. Oh boy, that was the significance of it. Now let's continue. Verses 11, and we will eventually get to verse 24. Verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And incidentally, this specific prophet and the old man, I think the, I'm not sure about the old man, uh, but uh, I don't think they are named at all in scripture. I say I don't think because offhand, I don't know if they're mentioned, their names are mentioned in like the book of the Chronicles 1 or 2. Okay, that is a possibility, but offhand, I don't think either of these prophets are named by name. I don't think. If I'm wrong, put the, Put that in the description box, or in the comment section, please. And I'll pin it. Okay? Please. But anyway, let's read verse 11 again. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also to their father. Also, too, the significance of the people not being named is who is the name of the Lord, the word of the Lord? Okay? unnamed individual speaking the word of the Lord. He must increase, but I must decrease, okay? 
And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which he came from Judah. And he said to his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God. He went after the man of God. Hinge this. We'll get back to it. And found him sitting under an oak. Why was he sitting there? Hmm? You know that guy uh, and brother, help me out with this in the comment section maybe, uh, that guy who went to Jehu, he was told, go do it uh, by Elijah or Elisha. Go do what you got to do. Break it over his head and bolt. Okay? The guy did that. The Lord gave that guy a little bit more things to say to Jehu. And he did that uh, because I believe it was uh, Elisha. It's like, go bust it over Jehu's head and then get out of there. And he, he went over there, but the Lord gave that guy a little bit more to give to Jehu. Busted it over his head and bolted. Okay? Why was this guy sitting around? Why was that guy sitting around? Hmm? You think about that, okay? And when he went after and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak, and he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said, Come home with me and eat bread. Now, come home with me. Yea, hath God said. God gave this man of God a specific way to go. Ah, are you getting the tie-ins now? Okay. He gave this man a specific way to go. You come in from this way. Don't eat anything or drink anything that's offered to you. By first the king and by a prophet who lies to him. Hmm. Very interesting. But you came in that way. You come in this way. Do what you gotta do. Don't don't touch anything. Don't eat it. <laughs> That's not in this text either. Well, about the touching thing. Okay? But don't don't eat any bread. Don't drink any water, okay? All right? Don't do that. Just do what you got to do and leave another way. But this prophet here, he was sitting under an oak. I, I think that's significant. I think that's significant, okay? But he says in verse 15, Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And of course, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 4. Now, the man of God was given a specific thing to do, how to do it, specific instructions before leaving earth, as they like to say, to whatever, okay? We have been given specific things what to do. Then was Jesus, Matthew 4, 1 on to 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit, into the wilderness, wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And when back in 1 Kings chapter 13, okay, verse 9, again, For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. Verse 10, so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. He was given specific instructions 
and we are not to live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The Lord gave him specific instructions. But yet, here comes a prophet. A prophet. It's telling him to do contrary to what the Lord gave him. And you search, you go ahead and read this whole chapter on your whole time. It's a really good chapter to read for you. Um, there is no evidence whatsoever that the Lord had any other thing for this man to do than what he specifically said. Because what is the argument? Someone could be like, well, maybe the old prophet was doing this because he was being con doing contrary. He wasn't. The man of God was being obedient unto what the Lord had said for him to do, this specific way to do it. He was being obedient. When did he become disobedient? And he said, verse 16, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord. Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. I bet you he was hungry. Kind of why we looked at uh, Matthew 4. Thank you. Okay. I bet you he was. We don't have any evidence about how long he went without food. But I bet you. I bet you he was hungry. I bet that flesh of his was like, hey, you know this guy? Hey. Hey. You know? Back to Galatians chapter 1. Back to Galatians chapter 1. This is also very telling about that man of God himself because he was being obedient. But the souls of prophet came along. Well, first, first, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 on to verse 12. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And another gospel is contrary to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's disobedience to what he has said in the scriptures for us today. Okay? Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, in this context about the, uh, the man of God and the old man, uh, different dispensation. The point is, the man of God was given a specific way to go, what to do, and instruction on how to do so. We just read verses 16 and 17. Okay? Specific. Came from the word of the Lord. The Lord himself. But though we are an angel from heaven? Verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. <clears throat> but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not of man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Kings 13, verse 18 now. He said unto him, I am a prophet as the, also as thou art. I'm a prophet too. Look at that verse with what we just read. See that tie-in right there, brother? And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. Uh-oh, yeah, God said. Saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Verse 
19 really quick. So he went back with them and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Question. Where's the scriptural evidence that this man even gave a second fleeting thought to like, oh, should I do this? Why was he sitting and not trying to haul tail out of there? Why was he sitting around? Why was he sitting around? Why did this man of God, who did a marvelous, marvelous work for the Lord, and the words that he said came to pass. It's verified in scripture. Why was he sitting there? Why did this man of God himself didn't inquire of the Lord? It's like, Lord, you, you he's telling me was he being a Berean, so to speak? Hmm? How quickly are some of us going to turn out of the way when offered with something and not be... Like with Joshua. Like with the guys who uh, came from... I forget where they were from. Where they came to Joshua. They tricked them. They lied to them. It's like, hey, we came from a far country. They brought... And they were like their neighbors. What did Joshua do? It's like, oh, sure. Come on in, guys. But they didn't go to the Lord about it, did they? Question, is there something in your life that you didn't go to the Lord about? And it's like, okay, Lord, I, I, know, I know what you say, but this, this, this Christian guy who calls himself a brother comes around and it's like, oh, well, you see, you, you can do that because you've just believed or something like that. It, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect your salvation. It's like, I know, I know. Hmm. Well, it's not going to affect my salvation. No, it's not if you're a truly saved individual. But, again, just because something isn't going to cost you your salvation doesn't mean that it's necessarily a wise thing to do as being an, as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you understand that. Okay? But he lied to him. He lied to him. He lied to him. Mm. Mm. And also about verses uh, 16 and 17, okay? Go to Romans chapter 6. Go to Romans chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, okay? Romans chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Come on, Brad. I'm not using my normal set of scriptures. <laughs> 15 and 16 in Romans 6. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Hmm. And then when you look at verses 16 and 17 again, he was given specific instructions in 1 Kings chapter 13, but he was lied to. Now, you can make the argument that he was deceived. You can, well, he, he was lied to. It says it right there. But even, the, even that, even in that, why didn't he first, like, okay, even, even though the scripture says right there that he lied to him, that he lied to him. Yes, he did. But why didn't the man of God, who's just sitting there, by the way, why didn't he it, be like, examine himself? Why didn't he first look in? It was like, whoa, that sounds good. That sounds like, oh, kind of man pleasing, doesn't it? Doesn't it? He didn't go to the Lord at all. He did not 
go to the Lord at all. So that also tells us something about that man of God, doesn't it? Man of God used mightily. Amen. But it also tells us a little. The fact that he was sitting there not trying to get out of there. And that the fact that he muy rapido. So quickly. Excuse me. So um, what, what was that in Gen uh, Genesis? And uh, I marvel. I marvel in uh, Galatians 1. Where he says, yeah, I marvel that quickly. Yeah, never mind. There. <laughs> That's a good one from you, brother. <laughs> I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So soon removed. So soon. So soon. Okay? You look at this context in 1 Kings chapter 13. This guy didn't even flinch. But it's like, right away. And he said, verse 18 again. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Why did he lie to him? Hmm? This man of God, I think, was obviously hungry. And the fact that he was sitting around under an oak, well, he might have been tired. Uh, you know, the Lord's like, you know, do something, get it done with, and then go out of there. Okay? And until, and until you go out of there, don't eat anything. Don't drink anything. Okay? Um, question. Wouldn't you? We would hope, right? Look, Looking back in retrospect, we have that advantage, right? But wouldn't you be like, okay, you said for me to do it this way specifically. Here's someone telling me that he's speaking for you, but is telling me totally contrary to what you had originally said to me. Uh, I think I ought to check uh, check it out with you to see if this is really of you. It happened with Joshua, and it happened right here. Do, do you examine yourself daily? Or well, once a month? Your checkup. Are you doing it daily? Are you are you searching these? Dude, if half of you guys would actually read the scriptures and rightly divide it. We lied to him. Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah, of course, Jeremiah. Of course, Jeremiah. There, well, there are so many other places we can go, but we're not going there today. Jeremiah 14. Verse 14, one verse. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not. Neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesied unto you a, a false vision, and a divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their own heart. It says of King Hezekiah, that the Lord left him so that Hezekiah might see what was in his heart. The Lord knew what was going to happen. But see, the guys from Babylon came around to Hezekiah. In the 15 years that was allotted to Hezekiah, after Hezekiah kind of was a little wimpy and cried to the wall, it's like, I don't want to go. And it's like, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. And what happened in those 15 years? King Manasseh. I rest my case, okay? But the guys from Babylon came to see Hezekiah. And the Lord left Hezekiah, it said, so that he might see what is in his heart. Not the Lord might see, but that Hezekiah might see. Hmm? What my point is, dear brethren, I think our man of God who did a wonderful work for the Lord, his, the words came true because they were the words of the Lord, I think our man here, our man of God, had a double-mindedness, had a trying to walk both ends and just couldn't wait to serve himself. 
That's why he so quickly um, ah, got hooked by the man who lied to him. Jeremiah 23, verses 16 on to verse 22. Thus said the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart. And not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me. <laughs> There's that despise for you, brother. That the Lord has said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Is that not what just happened in 1 Kings 13? For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord? And hath perceived and heard his word. Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury. Even a grievous, grievous, excuse me, whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. Fury? That's going to come to play as we continue in uh, 1 Kings there. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed and till he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. And are we not considering it today? Right now, today? Let's read verse 19 again. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously, grievously upon the head of the wicked. 21. I have not sent these prophets that they ran. Obviously, the Lord was involved with the thing with the, that we're looking at, but um, the prophet lied to him. He wasn't speaking truth. Hmm. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran, and he ran after the man of God. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Oh, it says in verse 14, and went after the man of God. Okay? Went after him. Okay? I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. If the old man obviously were sent to the Lord, it would have been more of an encouragement and admonition. It's like, hey, Lord was happy that you did that. Get out of here so you can go get something to eat and drink. Okay? But that didn't happen. Did not happen. Did not happen. Let's continue. Verse 19 in 1 Kings chapter 13. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Now here's the interesting part. Verse 20. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. The guy who lied, the word of the Lord came unto him. This man of God, this man of God, hmm, I think he had a little bit of a fleshly bent to him, don't you? But you saints are already getting the instruction in righteousness and where this is going. I know you do. I know you do. Because spirits um, identify. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah. Now just, uh, or I actually think that he was, because you, if you continue to read, um, I think that the, this older prophet guy was actually hurt that he did this thing to him. Just what I think. It came to, okay. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which, he, which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy father's. 
We already addressed the thing about dispensational difference and disobedience. We've already addressed it. You haven't booted the door and climbed up some other way, have you? Christian. Have you done something you know that you shouldn't have? And you're not going to lose your salvation if you're a saint, but who knows what you're going to lose? Hmm? I know you get this, saints. Lost people, I don't... Whatever. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he settled for him the ass, to wit, for the prophet whom he had brought back. Finished up his meal, it's like, okay... Talk about Last Supper, huh? Verse 24. Now, we've noticed the ass. Check this out. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way. You know where we're going, brother. You know exactly. Brothers, you know exactly where we're going. We're going to read it and then I'm going to tell you because saints, you know, when you say a lion met him by the way and slew him, you know where we're going. Uh, verses 6 and 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Be sober, be vigilant. Because the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. That was 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 on to verse 9. You saints knew exactly. You knew it's like, oh, I know where that, oh, I know where you're going, right? Go back to 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 24. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. When we get out of the way, and Satan is allowed through his ministers of righteousness or through the devils or whatever to afflict us because we have made the choice to go away from what the Lord has said, And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And the lion, you read, never tears the ass. But here's the thing about the ass. Go to Numbers. Go to Numbers. Numbers 22, verses 27 and 32. Balaam and his ass. That's a donkey, okay, a mule, okay. Get your head out the gutter, please. Thank you. Numbers 22, 27 out of 32. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, the ass saw the angel of the Lord. Balaam didn't. You talk about some instruction in righteousness for us today, huh, bro? Huh? <laughs> huh, sister? Yeah. When, and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto, uh, unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And I forget where it says that the ass spake to him with the voice of a man. I forget where that is. Someone in the comment section, please. Um, a female ass spake to Balaam with a man's voice. Interesting. 
Mm. Okay? And a talking donkey. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for I would now kill thee. For I, for now would I kill thee. Excuse me. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do, uh, do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. The ass saw the angel of the Lord before him, Balaam did. What happens? Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, we got to read because of the thing there. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Isaiah chapter 1. Point. And the point, of, we'll get to that, but the point. The ass. The ass. Oh, excuse me. Uh, before we get to uh, Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, uh, Psalm 32. Excuse me. Excuse me. Got out of order. Psalm 32. Psalm 32 verses 8 unto verse 11. Psalm 32. Sorry about that. Psalm 32. Come on. Psalm 32 verses 8 unto verse 11. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bits and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad and rejoice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous. And shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. In Isaiah chapter 1, <laughs> verses 2, on to verse 4. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nursed up and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner. <laughs> and the ass is master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. A sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Backward. In 1 Kings chapter 13... Look at verse 28 now. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass nor torn the ass. The lion in the way. Hmm. But the ass and the lion were there together, standing there obedient. Point is, Animals were doing what the Lord said when the man of God didn't. And when you go away specifically what the Lord has said, okay, if someone comes to you, preaches to you another Jesus, or preaches to you something that's like the Iberian, Search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. And if someone is trying to get you into a rapid decision, that's when you especially, it's like, dude, you back off, man. You ain't going to get me like that. <laughs> okay? 
That's when you back off. It's like, that's when you especially be like, oh, 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 now, now I'm definitely, I'm definitely getting me my scriptures and I'm going to, I'm going to check this out, buddy. And I'm going to wait and I'm going to wait to see what he says. The man of God didn't do that at all. Like I said, this man, this man of God, he did a mighty work for the Lord. And the prophecy came true because the prophecy was of the Lord. Okay? But this man of God, he was sitting under a tree when I believe he should have, it's like, the Lord said, don't eat or drink anything there. Get out of there. Go. Go. Okay? So I, and like, okay, I'm hungry. I need to get out of here. Besides, I was told not to stick around and go another way. And besides, I need something to eat. I'm getting out of here. Bye. And the argument is, well, it could have been too long, could have been too long. That's You're missing the point. You're missing the point. And this guy lied to him. And this man of God who was just used mightily, who before was in obedience. So this man wasn't allowed of Lord to tempt his prophet because he was disobedient. Rather, where was the man of God's heart? Still on himself. Because he all too quickly turned out of the way at a whim. And didn't even, there's not one lick of evidence that says that he even pondered it. Because you know what? If he did, I think the Lord would have showed us and told us. And the point of this is what we have just gotten at about obedience. Don't shriek when, you know, you are admo admonished to obey the Lord. Okay, we saints, we're saints. We're to be ambassadors for Christ. We are to obey the Lord. Okay, it will not cost us our salvation if we are disobedient, but it will cost us other things. So when you have a whole brand of Christianity whose whole bent is being disobedient, yet still justified, Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the face, faith, prove yourselves. Don't you know your own selves? Whether Christ Jesus be in you unless you be reprobate? I trust you're not reprobate. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. We'll see you in the next video.